All right, uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we have this opportunity to come together today to learn about how you have worked through history. And the fact is that you are, pro you are providential over everything. You have given us everything we need for our faith and practice, Lord, and that we have these tools that have been given to us by those who have come before us that you have blessed. And as we learn about them today, let us really take these things in and let us think on these things and think about our place within the history you have worked in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right. Uh, so today's member class is about confessionalism. And as you guys are probably aware, if you've been coming here for a little while, we are a confessional church. We subscribe to the Westminster Standards. That is the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, that is the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which we've been uh, reciting together Sunday mornings. And that is the Westminster Larger Catechism. And uh, there are other confessional statements, and we can talk a little bit more about those um, as we go through or in, the, or, or in our Q&A time. But... Um, yeah, until then, uh, so this is what today's class is on. So, our class, Christianity is a confessional religion. In fact, every religion, if it is a real religion, has a confession of some sort. Judaism has the Bar Mitzvah, in which a young Jewish boy or girl is declared to be a, quote, son of the law, which is what Bar Mitzvah means in the Jewish language. Islam has what's called the Shahada, by which a new convert has to say in Arabic that Allah is the only God and Muhammad is his true prophet. In fact, an atheist must confess that they don't believe in, don't believe that God exists at all. And at last, the Christian must confess, uh, the Christian must, quote, confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus. And that is in, found in Romans 10. In short, at the bottom of every religion is a confession of some sort. So the question is, what then is a confession? The simple definition is a positive statement of what is believed. A confession is a positive statement of what is believed. And generally the test to see if definitions hold, we can put the definition into different settings in which we would use the word confession and to see if it holds true. So a criminal confesses to a crime by having a positive statement of belief in his own guiltiness. A man confesses his love for a woman by giving a positive statement about the love he believes that he has for her. And then gives a token of that love, love in the form of a ring. There could be a lot more things we could put into this idea of a confession. And the idea is it's a positive statement. So what does it mean to have a positive statement? It is that stating something is in the positive is saying, I believe, whereas a negative statement would be, I do not believe. An affirmation is a positive statement. A denial is a negative statement. And so while thinking of the confession, and we'll get more to it as a document, there's a focus on what is believed, moreover, what is not believed. Now, in the Confessions, there is a little bit about what we do not believe, but if you were to read through every paragraph, you'll realize it is, we believe this about this. So, we have to ask the question, then, where do confessions start? Confessions start in the Scriptures themselves. Jesus was the first to make a confession. The Apostle Paul, in his first letter to Timothy, said of Jesus that in his testimony, or this is quote, in his testimony before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. That is 1 Timothy 6, verse 13. Well, what was the confession that Jesus made to Pilate? It was this, quote, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. That's John chapter 18, verse 37. There were also statements that Jesus made of himself that were captured within the I am statements that John makes in his gospel. And the other statements that can be found throughout the rest of the gospel where Jesus 
proclaims himself to be the Son of God and have all the privileges of being the Son. A positive confession. So next, there is the confession of Peter, where he says that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus praises this confession and then says that it is a foundation of the church by which Jesus will build his church. A positive confession that Jesus is the Christ. What is amazing about this confession is that later, when Peter has the opportunity to make a confession while Jesus was on trial, he ended up making a denial about Christ, rather than the confession that was made earlier in Peter's life. However, after that, on the day of Pentecost, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and made the bold confession of Christ to all the people that were there that day. And that's the sermon at Pentecost. And as the church grew, there were false teachers that would come into the church and started to spread false doctrines and heresies that were attacks against the institution and the people of God. In fact, these false teachings were coming in during the lives of the apostles. Meaning that the scriptures, within the scriptures, are arguments against these early forms of bad doctrine. Uh, 1 John, um, Hebrews, Galatians are just some of the examples of arguments against false teachings. And so as you think about the church growing within history, as time goes on and the church continues to grow, there are more false teachers that are coming into the church and bringing chaos. And this means that the need to codify the con a, a confession or the confession of the church becomes necessary to a survival. The Catholic creeds are the early statements made by the church to make, a, to make clear the basic teachings of the church. If there isn't a creedal or confessional statement, how can the church purge the heresy from within it? Or how do I tell the difference between someone that would be in orthodoxy if there is no doctrinal statements about the standard by which to test and judge. So that's why these creedal confessions come into being. So the first of these creeds is known as the Apostles' Creed. Uh, a, as a creedal statement, it is the most basic form of the gospel message that there is in Christianity. As Al Mohler said in his book about the Apostles' Creed, quote, people may believe more than the creed, but no Christian believes less. People may believe more than this creed, but no, people, but no Christian believes less than this creed. And so what is amazing about the Apostles' Creed is that it is, uh, is, that it is a, really a historic statement about the Gospel that includes the Trinity, the virgin birth, life, death, resurrection of Jesus, the completeness of the work of Christ, the reality of the new heavens and the new earth with new bodies, forgiveness of sins, and unity of the church, and life eternal. All those doctrines, basic core doctrines, are found within the Apostles' Creed, the first and basic. So for such a short and memorable statement, there's a lot of theology packed into it. There are also all the necessary statements within it to make a dividing line between Orthodox Christianity and Islam, or Judaism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, and anything else that does not have the fundamental, these fundamental truths at its center. First doctrinal gate into Orthodoxy, Christian Orthodoxy, is the Apostles' Creed. And so next, there were debates then, as the church continues to work through history, as it continues to grow, as people continue to figure things out, there were debates about the nature of Christ and how he did the work that he did on the cross. In fact, there are clearly false doctrines about Christ himself that show themselves in the lifetime of the apostles. The first letter of John is an argument against proto-Gnostics who were denying the reality of the humanity of Christ. Paul was fighting the Judaizers in their statements that Jesus' work wasn't quite enough and they needed something else added to it, uh, namely circumcision. Even if the Judaizers said that Jesus was God, uh, the fact that Christ's work fell short is indeed a failure to understand fully the person of Christ and the work that only Christ could do. 
So from these early forms to more advanced forms uh, include that of Arianism, the denial of the deity of Christ. Gnosticism, the denial of the humanity of Christ. And there would need to be more clear statements of orthodoxy that had to be created and agreed upon to further keep the church faithful to the scriptures and the Lord of those scriptures. So the next creeds that were to be written would have been creeds like the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed. These creeds primarily uh, are primarily about the nature of God and the nature of Christ. While the Apostles' Creed mentions the three persons of the Trinity, the Nicene Creed looks to define the Trinitarian nature of God and how that affects the work of God. And while there is a trinity, this also means that some definition about the nature of Christ also must be defined and understood. With these Catholic creeds setting the bar of orthodoxy, then there was a split, this is a historical fact, a split between the East and West around 1000 AD, or CE if you were publicly <coughs> trained. From there, the sides have then continued to, to define things and make sense out of more of what the Bible teaches. Unfortunately, these sides, primarily focusing on the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox, have created and defined doctrines and dogmas that doctrines and dogmas that undermine the teaching of the Bible. And clearly, in, in the early creeds that followed the time of the apostles. While in some sense these churches do fall into the broad parameters of the Catholic creeds. They have created and put on the same fundamental level things that the framers of the old creeds would not have put on the same level. So however, it's only logical that as the Bible is studied and meditated on, that definitions and ideas would become narrower and more precise in, uh, in, in our defining of doctrines. Not that things are defined on the same level as the gospel, so something like baptism is not on the same level as the gospel, but that things become clearer as all the cogs of the theological machinery are brought out to be studied. How does each part of our theology connect to another? And so as you can imagine, a machine, the most basic cog that turns the machine is that of the doctrine of God. And then other cogs are placed on that to create a... a a fluid machinery that helps us think through religious ideas. So therefore, a split between the East and the West, in some sense, is inevitable. Not necessarily because on, you know, not necessarily because one side or the other has jumped the orthodox ship, but because the secondary doctrines make it hard for people to worship together or govern the church to or, or, or to govern the church together, or any no number of things that are needed to be done in the life of the church. All Christians can agree on the same gospel, even if they may not agree on important things that have bearing upon church order and definition. So as time goes on, there is a single unchecked church in the West, so now we're focusing from worldwide to specifically the West, that had begun to work in the way uh, work in a way by creating uh, dogmatic statements through the notion of living tradition. The Church of Rome had lost its way and wandered from the original gospel that was codified within the Catholic creeds. By adding a sacramental system to the gospel of salvation and setting itself up as the ultimate authority, uh, the Church had a need to be reformed. But as reformers found out, had no ability to to be reformed. So then this progresses our timeline to the era of the Reformation, about the 1500s. Uh, reformations were attempted before the start date attributed to Martin Luther, specifically a hundred years earlier, at least, and even before that. Um, but there wasn't the technology of something like the printing press or something that gave the ability to get information to disseminated broadly within those times. And so as the reformers, especially the first and second generation ones, now we're looking to bring back biblical Christianity, uh, there arose a need, now that there's a new wave of people coming in, there arose a need to write and distribute new confessions of faith 
that reflected what these groups believed was the real message of the Bible. As Luther and Zwingli had a meeting to work through the doctrine, Calvin wrote the Institutes of Christian Religion, and various other groups met. And there was a resurgence of confessional writing and adopting that was going on during this time. Uh, even the Roman Catholic Church had to come together to make explicit what the church taught in the Council of Trent, the Anti-Reformation Council. So now, this does not mean there were not issues that had councils and synods called before this, per se. But the, but the observation here is that once there's this explosion of confessional writing during the time of the Reformation, is an important thing to note. Um, especially when Geneva, Switzerland, comes out with a confession, uh, the, the Heidelberg Catechism comes out, the Belgian Confession comes out, and others come out within 50 years of the beginning of the Reformation. Within 50 years. And so we can focus now from, once again, Europe, we're going to draw in because we're, remember, we're trying to get to the Westminster Standards, that's what our church follows. And so now we're talking about the Reformation and Confessionalism in England. So in fact, under 20 years after the start of the Reformation, at least the official one by Martin Luther, uh, England broke away from the authority of Rome and created its own church. While King Henry VIII started uh, this English Reformation for a reason that's probably not good, uh, the seeking of a divorce from his wives, we can see the trend where the Westminster Confession of Faith starts to come into the picture. However, the first confessional document of the Church of England was the 39 Articles. And it was a thoroughly reformed confession that was headed up by the first Archbishop, Thomas Cranmer. And while the Church of England had the 39 Articles, John Knox and fellows had also written what, uh, what was at the time called the Scotch Confession for the Scottish Presbyterian Church. There were also other confessional statements throughout the kingdoms within the UK. And from the time of the 39 Articles, for nearly 100 years, there would be changes in the church as there were changes in the government and with different acts of parliament and different kings and queens that would, that would take the throne and enforce their preferences upon the Church of England and the surrounding territories within the British Isles. So it's important, uh, 1643 is when these things happen. So the 39 articles are written in the 1530s, 1540s. So as you can imagine, within 50 years there's confessional writing. So in 1643, the nation of Scotland and the nation of England signed what is called the Solemn Covenant between Kingdoms of England and Scotland. This document was made to preserve, preserve the Church of Scotland uh, from encroachments by the Church and Nation of England upon and to reform the Church of England and Ireland. This meant that there was a need to put together a group of divines that could pour through the scriptures and put together a document that would be a governing document within all the different churches. Uh, after years of discussion, framing, and writing in 1646, the Westminster Confession of Faith was finally written and given to the parliaments that had called for the confession to be written. And then in 1647, the shorter catechism was finished, and in 1648, the larger catechism was finished and distributed throughout all the kingdoms in the U.S. The Westminster Confession of Faith was mostly, after that, used by the Scottish Presbyterian Church and the American Presbyterian Church, although the American Church made a few of their own changes to the Confession. But as we see in the history of the Church, at least up to the Westminster Confession of Faith, we see that the Christian Church has been a confessional church. The Confession of Christ has been the bedrock of the Lord building the Church for the last 2,000 years. As Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, so Christians from the day of Pentecost to today have made the same confession. As the church has grown, there has arisen a need to define what is meant by what it means to be labeled a Christian. As A. A. Hodge in his commentary on the Westminster um, tells us, he then gives four reasons for these creedal statements to be formed throughout history and even for today. So the creeds and confessions have a few uh, purposes for being writing. Uh, A. A. Hodge in his commentary gives four purposes for the creedal statements and confessions. First, 
It is to, quote, to mark, disseminate, and preserve the attainments made in the knowledge of Christian truth by any branch of the church in any crisis of its development. So it is to mark, disseminate, preserve the attainments made in the knowledge of Christian truth by any branch of the church in any crisis of its development. This means that as the church grew and matured and discovered truths that were in the Bible, the writing of creeds and confessions made sure that those truths were not lost to the ebbs and flows of time, but were preserved for generations to come, as long as the Lord should tarry anyways. The Apostle Paul commanded Timothy that he was to uh, take, quote, what you had heard from me and entrust the faithful men who would also be able to teach others, as 2 Timothy 2 Verse 2, in fact, later in the letter, Paul compares the false teachers that are causing trouble in the church to those who are led away by their passions and desire, while Timothy is to follow the teaching of Paul, who was an apostle and to continue holding to the sacred scriptures uh, in which he was taught from childhood. The Lord has always made sure, has always made a book or a written standard that has been promised and promised to keep that standard until there was no longer a need for it. Therefore, the Jews held on to the writings of what we call the Old Testament, and then the apostles wrote down letters and books of the New Testament. By doing this, they set down the standard that is needed for the church to remain pure and strong. But Jesus says, said that not one jot or tittle would pass away from the law until all is accomplished. And this was referring to the Old Testament books of the law, and could also be expanded to the histories and the poetic, uh, to the histories and poetic, and the poetics and the prophets, the wisdom literature. This then can also be expanded to anything that the Lord inspires after the ascension of Christ. So the Bible, not one jot or one tittle will pass away before all is fulfilled. But the Bible is a big book. While the guarantee of preservation is for the Bible, or that which is inspired by God, there is no guarantee that man will always interpret rightly or remember what is important. This means that crazy confessions are needed to preserve what is important for the doctrinal fidelity of the church. And while that canon is closed, that means the scriptures, the practice of study and application to every generation and against every foe is not over. In lieu of having to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation to explain anything that is believed about any particular subject, a creedal statement or a paragraph from a confessional document will suffice to know and articulate what is believed in and to be used to compare to those that would teach something different. These are much smaller and easier to handle in those particular situations. And while the development of uh, and just as a thought, this is a confession, a confessional book. But how small this is. I mean, that's, if you ask me what I believe, I can hand you this and you can work through it. And I think I have maybe exceptions to maybe one or two paragraphs. That's it. This is, this is what I believe about a lot of different things. Not everything, but a lot. So, while this development of doctrine is a thing that does happen, the need to capture and preserve what is good is important for the strength and purity of the church. So the second reason that crazy confessions are important is that they help to discriminate, quote, to discriminate the truth from the glosses of false teachers and to present in its integrity and to present in its integrity in due proportions. So simply put, the creeds and confessions are helpful in the defense of the faith against error or damnable heresy. Apologetics is something that every Christian does in that they have a reason, um, in that they have a that they are a follower of Christ, but defending the faith is not, uh, okay, apology is something every Christian does, and that they have a reason that they are a follower of Christ. That's what Peter calls us to. Have a defense for the hope that is within you. 
But defending the faith in general is not taking random pot shots from an indistinct location at another person's belief. Defending the faith is taking a stand, is taking a stand on a hill and taking on all who make an assault on it. There's a definite place that we should stand and therefore defend. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, the defense and attacking is a frontal assault, full frontal assault. The question is, how do you make that stand if you don't know where you're supposed to stand? Increasing confessions give us the layout of that battlefield. If we know the lay of the land, we can best engage the enemies of the faith because we know from where they are trying to attack us. Now, the Bible does have arguments against errors that we would encounter. It does have arguments against errors that we would encounter. However, though, again, the Bible's a big book. The creed or confession can help pare down to the bare bones what is being engaged about. It can cut through all the different weeds that we might run into. So a third purpose, according to A.A. A. Hodge, is a quote, to act as the basis of ecclesiastical fellowship among those who nearly agreed as to be able to labor together in harmony. So let's ask a question, considering this. What is the difference between a Reformed Baptist and a Presbyterian? Both would hold to the Apostles' Creed. Both would hold to the Nicene Creed. And both would hold to the Athanasian Creed. In fact, both would probably agree with the first Reformation creeds that were written. But a Reformed Baptist and a Presbyterian tend to hold two different confessional statements. The Baptist would hold to the London Baptist Confession of 1689, while the Presbyterian would hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, these documents are very closely related. And therefore, there's a lot in common, and therefore a great ability to labor together in the work of the kingdom of God and the spreading of the gospel. In fact, the two conventional statements are about 95% the same. However, there are differences that usually make the two worship in different churches. Because while they have many fundamental agreements, the secondary disagreements affect church governance and membership making the need to have a separation good for greater unity and harmony and labor. And so, if you think about it, if you have people who disagree in a church, there are good things that come about that. But sometimes, it can cause people to infight rather than push out. And so, confessions can help us work through those things. Uh, the fourth and last purpose of Christian Confessions is, quote, to be used as instruments in the great work of popular instruction. The Christian Confessions are great tools for the educating of Christians. If there's a new Christian, a creed or confession is a great way to teach the doctrines of the faith. As Vody Bauckham said, confessions serve as a standard and starting point for disciple making. So the question, where do we start when it comes to teaching the faith to a new convert? Where would you start? Why not start in chapter 1 about the scriptures? The confession is written in a manner that the more fundamental doctrines of the faith are in the earlier chapters, and the more potentially secondary doctrines that mark the specifics of the Westminster Confession are in the later chapters. This means that the confession makes a perfect template for discipleship. You get the fundamental things first, and then we work on the particular secondary things. And so in conclusion, creeds and confessions are a natural part of the Christian religion. It would, could be said that confession is a part of religion in general, but it's absolutely an important part of the Christian one. Without creeds and confessions, the church would be adrift in and directed by every wind of doctrine. But because of the brave and stalwart defenders of the faith, Jesus had used these saints of old to build his church. Not only has the church been uh, filled, but it has not 
fallen to heresy and been lost to history. It's been filled with heretics, but has been lost to heretics. Because Christ will build his church. There's a confession that is the bedrock of it. And the confessions help us keep it. It is important that, in that the fight to keep the church and to keep her strong has not been easy. And at times, there was a sense in which the church was going to be won by those who would oppose the gospel. But with each of these victories, the church codified the truth in writing it down in a creed or in a confession, keeping it available for all the generations to come until the Lord comes back. And that's part of the reason why we are a confessional church. All right. Uh, I guess open it up now to any questions or comments. Anything you need to drill more into or not? Or... Yeah. This is just... So, con we're a confessional church, and, you know, as you said, like, confession is a huge part of most religions. Mm -hmm. like, what would make a church non-confessional? Well, essentially not ascribing to a confession. So, so one of the things, if you think about, if, if you're thinking potentially... Uh, okay, being a confessional church as opposed to what? Especially when I say that Christianity at base level is a confessional religion. As opposed to what? Well, non -denomin a lot of non-denominational churches just kind of say, look, there's you know, no creed but Christ. Right? Uh, all I need is the Bible. Which is a creed. Which is a creed, right? And so, and so the question is, um, as opposed to what? There are people who say they have no confessions. But as soon as you ask them, who is Jesus Christ? And they start saying, Jesus is... Don't look now, but you're being a confessionalist. <laughs> okay? Unless you're going to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation with every theological question, you have to be a confessionalist. You have to, be a, you have, to have creedal statements, statements you believe, statements of affirmation. I believe Jesus is this. And therefore, then, someone who says Jesus is that, you can say, you're wrong. And we can keep that uh, difference uh, going. But there are people who say, you know, there's uh, no creed but the Bible, there's no creed but Christ. And what ends up happening is you realize it's really no creed but what I believe the scriptures all have to say. Which is still, we, we are confessional people. We believe things. We say we believe things. We deny things. We don't believe other things. And the question is why. And, and the creeds and confessions and those things help us discriminate between those things. Uh, any other questions? Just pragmatically speaking, closed or open canon? What? Closed or open canon? Closed. Yeah. That is this one. Um, yeah, so essentially if there's an open canon that would require certain other ideas to be uh, that would have to exist um, like the idea of the question of are there apostles today? Well, if we say no, the question is why? And if we say yes, there are ramifications to what that means. Um in fact, uh, yeah, so Westminster Confession, par uh, this chapter 1, paragraph 1, says this. Um, Although the light of nature, the works of creation, and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of his will, which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore, please the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare uh, his will unto his church, and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh, the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same holy unto writing, which makes the holy scriptures the, uh, to be most necessary, those former ways of God revealing his will unto his people be now ceased. So paragraph one, it says, 
God's revelation in the scripture manner is seized. And so there's a necessity to, to God write, having it written down. Um, and yeah, so you just, uh, let's see here. Where's the next one? Then paragraph two has seven. So yeah, paragraph two has all the books. Um, I'm trying to see, there's one here. Oh, yeah. So, then in paragraph uh, 6, it says, The whole counsel of God, concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture, or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time may, is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge that the inward illumination of the Spirit of God is to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things uh, as are revealed in the Word, and that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God, the government of the church, common to human actions and, and societies, which should be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the Word, which are always to be observed. So the first part of that paragraph is what we're talking about. Nothing is to be added. So God's revelation, the first claim is it ceased, and then nothing is to be added. So you can't, through the traditions of men, or even if you say, look, I have a new revelation of God. Well, if you think about it, if God's revealing has ended, and the uh, Hebrews 1 is true that he, God holds everything he needs to through his son, then if I say I have a revelation from God, I'm speaking on the level of Scripture. Which, if you think about hyper-charismatic churches, that means when they say, Thus saith the Lord, there's a river of the flowing of the fire and the fall and all this other stuff. There's, that's supposed to be scripture? It's nonsense. God doesn't speak like that. That's why they try to make these different ideas of, well, you know, it's prophecy, but it's not this kind of prophecy. Or, you know, they, start, they start making categories that don't exist within the Bible. And that's why it's important, you know, the confessionally closed canon. But the ramifications are then there are other things that, that, that derive from that. That would also mean that even though it's not within the confession, if there's no open canon, that means there's no apostles that are living today. There can't be, right? Because there's no new revelation needed. So there's no need to re, you know, rebuild the foundation. Uh, that's a long way to answer your question. But no, it's fine. Thank you. Yeah. And we should say it, it doesn't mean that that, uh, when we say that, it doesn't mean that the, the revelation that God has given doesn't appear new to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't start with all the revelation God has given. Yeah. Uh, so it might seem new. It's new to me. Any other questions or comments? What would you say is the difference between a creed and a confession? Um, I think what I would do is really just the kind of form of it. So if you think about the Apostles' Creed, it's I believe this. Um, even I think the Nicene Creed are statements of I believe this. Whereas the confessions... Um, like I just read to you, it doesn't say, I believe this, right? So they're more just kind of assertions, and it's, and it's written more systematically than maybe a creed is. Um, that would be prob prob probably the difference. Yeah, and typically you can put a creed on a page or two, yeah. whereas a yeah. confession would expand mm -hmm. more. Yeah, it would be a, more of a book, chapters kind of differences. Mm -hmm. So, just, I don't know if you've heard it in your couple classes you've been in here, but it is important, and I know there will be more, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's a class, but it is important that even we are a confessional church, we are an open membership church. Which means, if you came here today and said, I've never heard of anything called a confession, well, you can still be a member of our church. 
Um, in fact, you don't even have to hold to the Westminster standards uh, necessarily to be a member of this church. Um, but it is important that there's a reason we are confessional. Uh, there's a reason that we like confessions and we think that it's the proper way to govern our church. But just as a just as an aside, you know, we're not saying, okay, before you become a member, part of your member interview is we're going to give you a test about the, about the Westminster. You better get 100% on that. <laughs> or else you're not going to make it. No. Um, essentially, the philosophy of this church is our doors should be as wide as the gates of heaven. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we obviously believe that as you're here, as you're hearing the teaching, being convinced of things, we do believe you know, we are, since, since we are a confessional church, it's where we want people to go, but you don't need to be there to, to get it. So, um, and in fact, you don't really ever need to be there, even up to the leadership. Um, if you haven't heard already, I'm a Reformed Baptist, right? And I'm on the elder board. So even those things uh, don't necessarily uh, keep you from being, even in some leadership, confessional. And that's why, you know, Hodge talks about being able to work closely together, right? There is a degree of separation in, 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 in inside of theology that might, that might bar you from being an elder. But the Westminster and the 1689 are so close. <laughs> so close on so many things. Um, that uh, there's, a, there, there, there's an ability to work together. And like I said, that's, that's probably a whole other whole class that we'll the expanded version of our class. <laughs> so, um, anything else before we discuss? Uh, just a random tangent. So, closed canon, how do we know when you know Christ is making his return? How do we know? Yeah. Like setting a date? Or <laughs> not like setting a date, but like you know, it's gonna happen. Maybe not when we're here, but well, how, how do we look well, the scriptures here? already say he's coming back. Okay. So, almost two thousand years ago, the apostles said Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead, ascended. Oh, by the way, he's coming back. Okay. So we know that he's going to return. Um, I mean, that's what Revelation is all about, right? It's the end of the age. Um, and uh, so, you know, there is no need of new revelation, per se, that, oh, Jesus is going to come back. It's right. already been revealed, and that was revealed by the Apostle John. So, so yeah, so, so there's really, there's, there's one sense where there's nothing really new we need to know. That, that's why, uh, like, the Roman Catholic Church, um, when they set up tradition and scripture, they have two sources of doctrine. That's why they can say things like, look, Mary was sinless, like Jesus was. Well, where in the Bible is it? It doesn't say that. But that's the tradition passed down by the apostles, that Mary was sinless. Or Mary was bodily assumed. Or you can pray to Mary. Where do all of those doctrines come from? Which, by the way, a lot of those doctrines are day feeding. Like, you need to believe those to be an actual Catholic. Where do they come from? They come from the nebulous thing called tradition which in the Roman Catholic Church ends up being just the people you put into leadership who determine those things, say, hey, we should have this happen, and then they define it. You know, every Catholic has to believe. Well, that's another reason why, you know, creeds and confessions, like, you know, like, even like the Westminster. The last paragraph of the Westminster Conf uh, Confession, chapter 1, says the scriptures are the final judge of all controversy. So even the Westminster Standards put themselves underneath the authority of Scripture. If you have an issue with the Westminster Standards or the 1689, you go to the Scriptures and make your case scripturally. It's the, it's the final judge in all controversies, not the church. All right. Well, uh, I can pray for a time. We're out 10 minutes early. So, thank you all for coming. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you have given us these tools throughout uh, the history of the church, Lord, the history of your work in the world. 
up until this time, Lord. We pray that as we consider these things, when we think about these things, we would make use of all the tools and gifts you have given us, Lord. For they are a sign of your care for your people throughout all generations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.